Thank you all for joining us. My name is Katie Waisaki. I'm the Assistant Director in the Career Enrichment Network. We're excited to kick off our Fall Alumni Career Conversation Series um, with a topic focused on recruiting as well as some great opportunities with the, um, with the Fed. Um, today we have with us uh, John Allegro. Uh, John is a recruiter on the Talent Acquisition Team at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, DC, where he oversees a portfolio of technical and non-technical full life cycle recruiting. The agency's uh, new employee orientation program, as well as a portion of its early career strategy and summer intern program. He serves as co-chair of the LGBTQA plus employee resource group, leading event planning and educational programming. While at Penn State, John did a four plus one master's program in the education policy program within the College of Education. While on campus, John worked as a graduate assistant in SMEAL, a resident life coordinator in Pollock, sang in the choir, Essence of Joy, and a cappella group, the Code of Conduct, and a few volunteer activities. Outside of work, John sings with his choir, the Essence of Joy alumni singers, volunteers with Out for Undergrad, a nonprofit organization focused on professional development and career readiness of LGBTQ plus students, and is an indoor cycle enthusiast enthusiast and coffee lover. So John, thank you so much for being here. Oh yeah, thank you. I'm really excited to chat with y'all. Um, it's funny, I so I started out um, the presentation today with a little like where we started because this actually just came up in my memories uh, on Facebook. So how funny, uh, from freshman year, this was our, one of our first activities in the hub, uh, probably like Monday night, Tuesday night, when all we were doing was trying to figure out where everything was and what we were doing. Um, so I probably should have thrown in a few other um, a few other photos from all the things that you listed. Um, so yeah, so I'm a 2017 grad um, and uh, came out of the College of Ed formally, uh, but feel like I've always been just as connected to liberal arts um, in not only my coursework, but just in the folks that I knew and the things that I had done on campus in a lot of ways. So uh, really excited to chat with you all today. Um, so it was funny kind of putting this together. I was like, I'm gonna just put a few slides together to figure out how I focus my own life and kind of uh, connect everything together. Um, so to explain how all of these things you see on the screen kind of led to a life in HR and recruiting. Um, so the two items on the left. So when I was in high school, I really, Mrs. Stoner, my Spanish teacher was like my favorite person in the world, loved Spanish. It was the only subject I talked about when you know, everyone was like, oh, how was school today? Um, and I also just always really had kind of this helping bug that was innate within me. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll be a Spanish teacher. That would be cool. So that was what I went to Penn State kind of intending to do. Um, slash I actually entered undecided in DUS. Um, and, but that was kind of the focus. I was all over the place. Uh, the little group of medical folks at the bottom is because my mom is an anesthetist and my dad is a pharmacist. So growing up, everyone was like, oh, John's going to be the doctor, right? And like complete the medical pyramid. Well, <laughs> that didn't happen. Um, and so, you know, that was always in the back of my head too. So I say that because, you know, there, there are always those things like you come into school and you have the things like that you've thought of, and then the things that kind of hang out in the back and you're like, all right, what do I do with this? Right. Um, so exploring that it, led me to basically either ed policy or health policy was kind of how I narrowed that down um, through all of my coursework that I loved. And uh, then just decided that the ed policy route was a little bit more for me. What I was gonna do with that, wasn't really sure. And then somehow um, all of that got into the HR space. And basically I had said to myself like, well, I love education. I don't wanna commit to teaching because you have to do that like pretty much first semester of school, right? Um, but I still get to study all the things that I enjoy. Maybe I can find a way to do education in a different way that's not being in the classroom and we'll figure it out because it's only sophomore year. Um, so that was kind of the, the strategy for that. And then the professional journey, I feel like this is just a really easy slide to kind of sum up the resume and also just the things that you don't always see on the resume that kind of are an overlay. So the things at the bottom. Um, so I, my first internship was in Philadelphia. So I worked in the mayor's office for youth engagement. Um, and so that was very much like uh, apples to apples in terms of a match to my, what I degree that I was pursuing and everything that I've talked about, right? So we spent time, we would go to Harrisburg every week and you know, meet with state senators and state reps on education issues in the city. And then we'd come back to the city and every Friday I would walk around 
different neighborhoods promoting free summer meals programs, uh, which is basically the equivalent of free lunches just for students in the summertime, right? So that we would go door to door because uh, they're a little different. They're not always administered at the school. They're administered at community sites throughout. So it could be anywhere from like a community center to a library, or it could be like just your grandma's porch and she hands out meals to everyone on the block, right? So it was door knockers and uh, talking to folks in local businesses. Um, so very kind of traditional, like boots on the ground policy work that you would think of. Um, really enjoyed that. Had a great little team, um, had a lot of fun, got to write a white paper that I ended up using a little bit my junior year of school for things. Um, and then uh, still that summer before in Philly, I had just started being an RA. So I started being an RA on campus, really got interested in the student affairs stuff, uh, came back junior year and was doing that again. And then I had also taken on that summer or that school year uh, being a peer education coordinator in the LGBT, what was the LGBTQA Student Resource Center then. Um, and uh, so I led the Straight Talks program, which was a peer education program that I think they still run. Um, and so just kind of fell in love with like this whole other side of education that I hadn't thought of. And actually that wasn't super related to my major either, right? Because ed policy, at least at Penn State, is very K through 12 focused. Um, so then that next summer, I went up to Brown um, had a great time uh, eating lots of Dell's ice and everything else that's good about New England food and lots of lobster and all the other seafoods um, and spent the summer working uh, in their student summer program. So I, it was a leadership uh, camp that they ran three sessions, three weeks long. Um, so it was high school students that came from really actually all over the world, uh, hung out with us for three weeks, uh, picked a course that they were most interested in that they pursued for the three weeks. And then we put them through a myriad of leadership development things. So my days there consisted of anything from actually working with a public policy professor at Brown to kind of come up with a summer curriculum and teach students in a formal classroom setting, all the way to we would go out to a low ropes course uh, on the coast and people would like cry about their tick socks and oh I'm afraid I'm gonna get ticks and I've never been in the woods before and right so it was all sorts of things that we dealt with that summer um, but super fun uh, then I came back and that was when I had just technically signed up for my fifth year at school um, and I really made that decision um, one just because of the ease of like wow how can you pass up only one more year at the same place I'm familiar with to get a master's degree. Uh, but the key, I always kind of, a lot of times I will talk about careers around locks and keys. Like there are lots of locks that you need to open or could open, you don't have to, and they don't all require keys and some do, and the keys can be different. So that's kind of like my cute metaphor for that. Um, but I had this growing interest in student affairs work. Um, wasn't sure where I would end up in that space, whether it would be residence life or I had had a growing interest in career services and I'd gotten really close with a number of my academic advisors and found that interesting. Um, but you needed a master's degree to unlock that, right, for the most part. Um, and so I was like, well, uh, let's do this. This sounds like an easy, cool, fun, uh, somewhat cost effective way to do this as well. Um, so we signed up for the program. And so I was technically in it beginning my fourth year. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, wow, now I have a whole nother summer to intern. Oops, didn't think about that. What am I going to do all summer um, or just work or do whatever? Um, so then I was really, I, so the Out for Undergrad organization that Katie mentioned um, is a nonprofit that the email about the program just was one of those random emails, you know, that you get over and over again in your inbox. And I was like, okay, let me read this. So hmm, this sounds kind of interesting. Um, let me apply, see what it is. They were like, oh, you can come to New York City for the weekend. It's a free conference. You get to hang out, meet folks. And I was like, all right, that sounds fun. Uh, like free trip and meet people. Cool. Uh, the extrovert in me was all about that. So I went to the conference and had no idea what anyone was talking about. It was all, so they run conferences in business, technology, marketing, and engineering. I didn't know anything about it, really any of that, but the closest thing I could get was business. So I was like, I bet I can like get them to let me in for that, right? So I applied for that. They let me in, got there, had no idea what anyone was saying. They were all talking about investment banking terms I'd never heard of. Uh, we sat in a session on M&As and I was like, I have no idea what this is, but we just went through an hour talking about mergers and acquisitions, uh, had no idea what that was. So I felt very fish out of water until I finally found this little teeny corner uh, called human resources. And I was like, hmm. Um, so found some familiarity there and uh, was like, well, I guess if we're going to 
kind of, you know, squeeze all the juice out of the lemon for this conference. Cause just me, I felt very like defeated, like, oh, like I'm not taking advantage of this. It isn't what I want it to be. Um, that was where I focused my energy. So I ended up connecting with AIG, which is a big insurance firm. So they do mostly uh, corporate casualty and large uh, high wealth clients uh, and investments. They do some property casualty stuff too. Um, anything but individual policies pretty much. So sometimes AIG is kind of it's out there because of the financial crisis, but most folks don't know about it as much because it's not a State Farm or a Progressive or a Geico. Um, you can't call them up and tell them to insure your Toyota Corolla. So, um, so I went over there uh, and um, kind of stayed connected with them through the conference, found out they had an HR summer internship program and that they were specifically looking for someone to join their university recruiting team. I was like, all right, well, I've spent all this time like, obviously going to school, but also kind of working at school in all these offices that know things about students and higher ed. Uh, so let me try and thread that together. Went and interviewed uh, and then did that summer internship at AIG. So that really kind of changed the entire course of uh, my career. Just that one, really that one email that I uh, looked at <laughs> and then went to the conference and then got interested in the HR space. So when I went to AIG that summer, um, I spent half the summer with their university recruiting team. And I spent the other half of the summer actually with their uh, early talent training and development team. So basically they were the group that for all of the recent college grads, they would develop all of the onboarding curriculum for the six weeks that they would need to get up to speed for their full-time analyst programs. So again, this like education thread bug kind of was fed in that moment, right? They were literally looking through experiential curriculums and developing tracks for different lines of business and working with a vendor on programming and content um, I got to present things. And then I got to go over to the university recruiting side and basically just know all the things I knew about being a college student and apply that to helping them to hire folks too. So it felt like this like perfect harmony of life. Um, and then I got back to campus and I got my assistantship at SNEAL. So the thread continued. I did student org advising there. And then I also worked with employers to help set up events in SNEAL. So then I was really confused because I was like, well, I love all this student work, but then I did all this recruiting stuff and it's really cool too. And what do I do? So as you can see by the arrows, uh, we went the recruiting route. And so I joined the Fed um, in October of 17. So a few months after I graduated and I've been there since. Um, I first started in kind of a smaller recruiting coordinator role um, where I was only focused on their research assistant program and some of their internships. And now for the last two years, I'd moved up to a, a full-time recruiter position, uh, recruiting all across the agency. So I do a little of everything. Um, and then I have the, the items up top are kind of overarching, right? Penn State, obviously from an education standpoint, super influential, but also from all the things that I did while on campus and took advantage of both working um, and just kind of developmental programs were super, super helpful. Um, I had a great network of student affairs folks um, in particular that were always kind of, I think they are the, the reason that I am doing okay today for a number of ways. Um, NUF in the middle there is a fellowship program that I joined um, that, so the National Association for Student Affairs Professionals, so that one of the big student affairs uh, professional orgs runs NUF, which is a fellowship program for undergrads who are interested in student affairs careers. Um, so I really got to help explore and network through that. Um, and then now I also have done uh, HR certification SHRM too. So there's all these other things too that, right? Like you can look on the resume. So this is basically like a picture version of my resume, um, but not really, uh, it, sometimes it is one of those things, even for me, it's still really hard to figure out. So how, how does this all connect and how did we get there? Um, so yeah, so that's the journey. And now we spend our day recruiting and this is what a typical day for me looks like. Um, and it, it varies. I actually thought about trying to make this into a pie chart just for like visual aesthetic to be like, oh, this is what I spend most of my time on, but it really changes a lot. So it would have been a, I don't know how accurate of a pie chart it would have been. Um, but things that you, you know, if you think about HR recruiting jobs probably won't be surprising to you. So recruiting and campus events and reviewing resumes, which there are plenty of those. Um, candidate screening calls, right? So I'm usually the first point of contact for any candidate that we're moving forward in the process. So I'm doing sometimes like seven, eight, nine, 15 minute calls um, a day, which can be a lot. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's kind of the bread and butter, right, is like reviewing candidates, talking to them and getting them in jobs, right. But then there's kind of this whole other side of it that I um, 
that really can take up a lot of time. So that hiring manager business line consultation is my best way to put that. Um, spend a lot of time with that, depending on the role. Um, and that is, so, you know, really helping managers figure out like, is this what you need to post, right? There are times when I'll get a job and I'm like, sure, I'll put it up right away. It looks great. And then there's other times like I've just held one for a week because I'm like, mm -mm, this is not, uh -uh. We're like, we're not putting this up yet. We got to figure this out. I think there's a few things that need worked out here. Um, then we'll put it up, right? Um, so for me coming into the role, I really, so all of my experience kind of advising in grad school and doing the career counseling that I did at SNEAL and working with students as a res life coordinator and in the RA role, that was all very consultative, right? It was like taking all the pieces, kind of like a puzzle, figure out what the person is telling you and what they need and find the gaps and then move that forward, right? Whether it's empowering them to do X, Y, and Z and make a choice, or it's putting a stop gap where it needs to be put, right? So all of those skills, I do pretty much every day now just with hiring managers or the business line too. Um, and so, and it's also, I think, listening for things and looking for things that aren't right in front of you or that people aren't telling you. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's really cool. I just bring that up because you're going to have moments as you move into your full-time career where you'll be like, what, what, like, is, is this, does this make sense? Like, does any of this have a point, right? And then you'll have these aha moments where like all of a sudden everything in the back clicks together and it feels really cool like that. Um, so that's one of those really clear things where I'm like, okay, um, you know, this, this all did lead intentionally to here. Um, I didn't necessarily put all the stones in a line to get here, but, but we got here either way. So that's a big piece of the role. Um, and again, for recruiters too, and you know, you'll hear from other recruiters either trying to learn from about their organizations from them or in chats like this where they're maybe talking about themselves a little more. It's a little different like most jobs depending on where you are. So I am really fortunate because for me, I get to do a lot of a, a wide variety of things. Um, other recruiting roles, you know, I've interviewed for places and they're like, yeah, we'll need you to fill like you know, 175 seats this year, and we need you to go through like 30 pre-screen calls a day, and that's your life. And I was like, yeah, that's not going to work for me. Uh, not going to work, right? Um, so, see, so yeah, I've definitely realized the variety there. Um, I get to serve as our employee resource, resource group chair, so that also makes me really feel like I'm back on campus still in fun ways. Um, so, uh, that's really fun. Get to put together events and talk to folks who are coming in new to the organization and help create a little corner of community for them, which is always super fun. Um, and then, um, and that also entails a lot of policy work for us too, just because of the nature of like us being a federal agency um, there, that's really kind of our opportunity to make some change and being in the HR space, there's some synthesis there, which has been kind of fun. Um, so I've gotten to work on some really cool things like updating our parental leave policy and creating like gender inclusion guidelines for the agency. So things that really have like kind of larger systemic impact, um, kind of just beyond my immediate, which is pretty cool. Um, and then spend some time too on just like special project work and kind of relationship management, whether that be with candidates that aren't that are in a process or aren't quite yet, uh, campus partners, um, internal stakeholders as well. Um, so it really is kind of a wide variety of things in terms of what the typical day, uh, what it looks like. Um, but I think my biggest thing um, is always this. Uh, so, you know, there is that Steve Jobs quote that everyone feel like they use, you know, connecting the dots backwards. For me, it's actually connecting them backwards and forwards. Um, and that's how you really turn the, turn the corner in being strategic about how you think about your career moving forward, either in, whether it's looking for internships and part-time opportunities while you're in school, whether it's looking for the first time role, or if it's um, at any point down the, down the line, right? Um, it's themes, it's skills and tangibles that you bring, and it's the exposure that you want and need to either get to that next step or to understand where you've come from. So, right, a lot of what I talked about today is kind of looking backwards and having those aha moments, but I've also used that a lot um, to think about what I want and what I need going forward too. So that was really how, so I'll give you just a quick example and then would love to have questions and thoughts about anything. I can also talk a little bit about um, specifics about the Fed and opportunities we have if that's of interest, um, but didn't wanna make this a super recruiting centric moment. Um, but so I, I mentioned that I've, already, I've had two roles while at the agency within the last four years or so. Um, so in the 
first two years, you know, I didn't enter the role being like, okay, I need to leave in two years, right? Um, but started to kind of see what the horizon looked like, what I was learning, what I wasn't, what I felt like I needed to know to move forward, how long did I want to stay in recruiting, what knowledge did I need to either kind of become a subject matter expert in the area, or was I going to move to a different area of HR? Um, and right around that two-year mark, I was like, I need to be able to do more actually of this, right? Being in front of people, talking, facilitating, um, doing some knowledge sharing and some consultative things. And I wasn't getting enough of that in the role. So like while I was doing a good job and everyone was okay with my work um, and, you know, given all the snaps and claps, I wasn't really like feeling it in my soul, right? Because I wasn't doing as much of this kind of, um, and I had missed that. And I'd done a ton of that on campus too, right? Like running that peer education program at the center, that's all I did. I mean, we ran like, I think we had almost 50 sessions a semester. So I was anywhere from like in a fresh, in a first year seminar to like a frat house downtown to a staff meeting with housing and food services. I was all over the place and doing the same thing, right? Really being that kind of educator facilitator. Um, so knowing that I had sought those things out in previous roles uh, and in previous experiences and in my education, I was like, cool, that's a theme I need to keep forefront no matter what, like moving forward. Doesn't mean I'm gonna search for facilitator jobs, right? But it means that I need to figure out if that's gonna be a focal point of the role um, and figure out how to get there no matter what that is. Um, and so that was really for me a big decision point when the new opportunity opened up uh, to recruit for the whole agency, I was like, cool, we're going to go do this. Because um, I'll learn really tangible skills too. I've learned a ton more of just kind of basic HR knowledge that I wouldn't have known. Um, just by the nature of I've gotten to work in a number of different roles and things that have different needs. Um, but I've also just been able to have so many more opportunities to kind of facilitate and, and teach folks and kind of be that uh, point of knowledge for other people too, that I really enjoy. So I just gave a presentation last Tuesday, uh, the days have all been running together, um, in our HR town hall um, on pronouns. So we had added them to our email signatures, I want to say in winter, kind of like February, March timeframe, but no one really said why they got added. Um, and so I said, hey, uh, head of HR, Tamika, um, why don't we, can, like, can I have 15 minutes in the town hall? And she was like, sure, you can have a half an hour. Here you go. And I was like, okay, cool, half an hour. Um, and so put something together and was able to kind of capitalize on that moment. And, um, you know, and so I provided a really clear gap filler, right, in need for the organization, but also fed my soul at the same time. So if I can give one moral of the story, anytime you can make that happen, um, filling your soul and making someone else happy at work, uh, do it. Because that is really where you end up in a really sweet spot of kind of closing the laptop or leaving the office and feeling cool about yourself. Um, and also being in a good place to, you know, maintain your brand, um, show the value that you bring to the team or the organization. Um, and yeah, that I think when you can find that harmony spot, it's really, really cool. I don't have a formula for that, but I think part of it is making sure you know those themes that you want to always be present um, and then just keeping your antennas up, right, for, for knowing what value you offer and what gaps you're willing to help others fill. So. Yeah, that was all the prepared kind of chat that I had. Um, hopefully that was interesting. It's always kind of funny to talk about yourself that much. Um, but yeah, happy to chat more and take questions. And again, I can talk a little bit more about Fed specific things if anyone's interested. Um, yeah. Thanks, John. Wonderful advice. And thank you so much for talking about filling your bucket and going beyond you know, the everyday. That's very important. Um, so definitely open up. It's a meeting style format today. So um, if you'd like to unmute um, or take the camera off or send a question through chat, you're all welcome to do that. For John, as he mentioned, you know, we can talk about the HR piece of things. We can talk about the Fed. Anyone have a question? Hello. <laughs> um, that was all awesome to hear, John. I really enjoyed uh, listening to how you got to where you are, why you're where you are, um, and what is feeding your soul, because <laughs> I do believe that that is super important. Um, I currently am not in an HR role, and I am trying to make a sideways swipe, if you will, into an HR position. 
Um, I'm just finding it very difficult because I have no background in HR specifically. So I'm kind of getting the stop signs at every, <clears throat> every road I try to take. Um, but I am currently enrolled for my master's degree in HR and I am trying to be persistent and pursue it because I am I feel that I will be very passionate in that sort of a role. And I wasn't sure what all recruiting, like I'm trying to feel my way as far as where in HR I would best serve. So I wanted to hear what you had to say in regards to recruiting and, and yeah, I guess. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, so recruiting tends to be, so actually, so in the student affairs space, right? everyone always would say res life, right? You have to start in res life. That's where the most positions are. You got to spend your time. It's kind of like doing your penance of like two years of residence life and then you go do something else, right? That was always I the did narrative. That. Like, I did right? that check. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny because I felt like, I was like, I was an RA for three years. I was a, then I was a res life coordinator all through that last year of grad school. I was like, I'm cool. Like, I know I did it as a student, but like, I don't want to do that again. Like, I'm good. I loved it. Learned a lot. Time for new things. Um, so there's, I say that because there's a similar narrative around recruiting is that like recruiting tends to be the big entry point. That's kind of how you have to get in unless you have previous experience and then you're cool. I think there's also this weird, we're at a weird time in which a lot of HR professionals, I would even say 15 years plus of experience, they didn't get a degree in HR. There were no, there were very few degrees in HR in general, right? Um, you fell into it. Uh, my aunt is actually a great example of that. She has a degree in art um, and it was the 80s and she worked at um, Pottery Barn, which I'd love to know what the catalog looked like back then, having not been around to see that. Uh, still told her she, I hope she saved a few of those. Uh, met this, I forget how they met, ended up there's a small coffee company in the city called Orange Daily Roast. It's like very funny. She met him, they got talking, they became really good friends. He needed someone to do HR. She was like, cool, I'll learn it. I don't know anything about that. Ended up doing it for like 30 years, right? So I feel like that's the narrative for a lot of folks um, who have been in the space for a while. And then we have this new wave of people who either have done really related work and gotten into it and found a way to thread it together, which I guess maybe I could throw myself in there um, and people who have HR degrees. So the, the degree is gonna give you a, an, um, a layer of legitimacy, I think to just at least get you through the door because there are people out there. It's funny because we often talk about like, oh, how do we, how do we keep a discern, a, a appropriately discerning eye on candidates? You know, There are a lot of HR people that are like, no, I need just this. And they draw this really hard line. Um, so there will be amount of legitimacy there. I think on the other side, in terms of, and actually maybe to answer your question a little more in terms of the space you could end up, um, recruiting is a little tricky because there's a lot of it out there, but like I mentioned, it, it varies a lot. So there are a lot of positions that are high, you almost feel like you're a sales rep, right? Um, especially if you're at a headhunting firm or a staffing agency where it really is just all about churn and numbers. And, you know, JP Morgan called us up and said they need 100 people in their call center and I need you to fill that as quickly as possible, right? That is not my vibe. I interviewed for those places um, and I was like, you people seem lovely, but I will just literally go to work like with, I'll be stressed all day, every day. Um, and I do, I, and it's funny because I, I have a high volume here for the agency, but it's hard because when I talk to other people and I've interviewed for other positions, they're like, oh, you only filled that many a year. I'm like, yeah, but the, the background, like what it takes to do that, right? So the roles are all a little different um, in terms of where you're at. Being somewhere like here, things move slowly. I have to know a lot of policy and process more so than other places. Um, other, you know, you work in, and so, and it's all flavored by the industry a bit. Um, project management is going to be a huge space. It continues to grow uh, and workforce analytics. So those are also two spaces. If you can, um, so our HR project management office is only five years old and our workforce analytics team is only four years old. So even for us, those are totally new spaces. So you're gonna see more and more of that. So your previous experience guarantee there are some ways you can make some project management threads to that. I don't even know what you've done before right now, but I guarantee you can do it, right? Um, and so that might be an entry point to think of. Um, data skills and analytics, um, you know, those are a little trickier to obtain and a little more niche, but they just continue to grow because 
uh, HR continues to build, I think, analytics in like in-house more so um, rather than having that out. So I think those are two things just to keep on your horizon. Um, and um, yeah, otherwise I think, and recruiting is also, and the other side on the recruiting space, the other plug I always give for it is it's a great way to become a generalist because you have to know a little of everything. So there are times when I'll talk to my other HR colleagues and I'm like, you're only thinking in compensation right now. Like, cool. Um, I need you to think a little outside the compensation box because you're not like, you know, they'll just answer the question directly. And I'm like, okay. Um, whereas I think as a recruiter, I, and I've said this to my boss a million times um, and just, it took me a while to realize, I was like, we have to know a little of everything and like be able to think about things from multiple angles. Like I have to be able to get on with a candidate and know the benefits package and know how to just build a relationship with them. And I have to know how to figure out what compensation is going to look like and what their needs are. And if the skill sets are right fit and, you know, there's so many things to it that aren't from other areas. Um, so I will say too, while it, it is kind of still looked at as like the entry point of a bit of hazing. Um, you do learn pretty much everything in that space. I like that. That sounds like a really good way to go about it. Um, obviously, the more you can learn, the better you're going to be in your role. So that's a really good way to look at it. Okay. I hadn't thought of that. So I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. And like I said, I think the project management space would really be another, I think that's another big focus and you're going to see project management offices pop up constantly because they, you know, change management, like we're putting in a whole new HR um, IS system. So we're going to Workday from PeopleSoft, we're changing all of our financial systems. So, you know, there's a whole crew of people that are working to do that. Um, and I've actually even had to put a lot of time on that. I'm like, I don't know anything about back end of technology, like the systems, I don't know how they work. Like I know the buttons I click on my side. Um, but yeah, so there are things that you don't need the super technical niche skills either, right? Like you don't need to be an expert on how to program the back end of Workday, you know? So, and don't be afraid of the stupid things that'll be in job postings too that say like, you need to have exposure to like to lay a recruiting system or to like people fluent. I hate that. It's one of my big HR pet peeves when they're like, you need to know the super niche HR system to come here. Like, no, you don't. Um, so. Don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. That's good advice. <laughs> Great question, Jennifer. Anyone else have a question? Hi. Um, so I'm Shamita. I am currently an undergrad student. I'm about to graduate in spring and I'm a poli sci major. So I've done a lot of things that you've also done. I'm currently an RA here in East. So I have that great skill of coming up with solutions with people every day. Um, I kind of wanted to know, like, what are some like maybe openings or positions that are available right now with the federal in terms of like recruiting or analyst positions? Yeah, so we don't, we don't have a ton in HR. Um, and when we do, it tends to be in like, like just cycles of like all of a sudden we'll have three openings and then we have none for like a year. Um, so we don't have anything that I know of on the horizon in our space right now, um, but that could change through the spring. Um, so happy to keep in touch. And we don't, in terms of us specifically, our full-time positions are not timed to really run along the academic year as much as other organizations do. So we don't, um, other than our research assistant program, which is typically for folks in economics, um, they come in and they do traditional research work and policy work with economists, right? So that one is uh, a big influx of recent grads for us uh, and it's time for the academic year, but everything else is kind of a, when it's open, it's open. Cause we're not actually a huge organization, like on the news we're big, right? Cause everyone hears about us, but we're actually only like just under 3000 people. Um, so we don't have a ton of, you know, we're not a huge cabinet level agency. So I think it's always funny. It's an interesting thing uh, it, that I've learned about the brand is like, I show up to places, um, especially with econ students even, right? And they're like, oh my God, it's the Fed. I'm like, cool, we, we, yes. And then in terms of hiring people, I don't have 300 positions. Like I'm not uh, JP Morgan, right? Um, I don't have that much uh, influx or I'm not EY showing up to campus, just like handing out positions like their business cards. Um, so yeah, um, so we, we will have, we do have some opportunities in that space. Um, and then 
we also, I will, this is just kind of a, a uh, maybe a more overarching suggestion comment for you. Um, depending on, again, not knowing exactly what your interests are, um, we, so I do tend to get a lot of students too sometimes that will be interested in kind of more of our policy oriented work or things that are maybe more traditionally DC, right? Um, so like congressional liaison kind of work and um, basically being a policy wonk, right? So we have policy wonks, but they're a bit more on the subject matter expert side. Um, and we don't do a lot of congressional um, uh, kind of work. We're not up on the Hill. We go on the Hill twice a year when the chair is required to, and we publish the report that we're required to. That's about it. I mean, we had, there is a team that um, actually hires a summer intern every year and usually has some full-time roles every once in a while um, that manages all of our, you know, public inquiries and anything that comes down from Congress, but we're not a huge agency and we're not appropriated by Congress. So, and I say that too, not just about us, but it's an interesting, it's something to keep an eye out for if you're interested in exploring other DC opportunities in general or anything else in the federal government space, the larger the agency, and if it's appropriated, which is the word they typically use, right, the more uh, turn there's going to be, right, more political swirl, uh, you know, things happen. We are not appropriated, so we are very boring in that way, um, in that we don't have a lot of funding discussions. Our funding actually comes from the reserve banks, so when you cash check and the reserve bank charges your bank the fee to process that, that money is actually what funds the Fed. Um, it's always like a fun disclaimer that I always throw out there, because then I have like my, you know, sassy uncle that's like, oh, you're spending my tax dollars. I'm like, actually, I'm not, but cool. Um, so yeah, so I put that out there. We do have some things. I'd be happy to keep in touch touch um, because again it's really hard for you to for me to tell you when they're going to come up um, and I can always you know send them your way and see where you're at um, but otherwise I think that's just another good rule of thumb in terms of like smaller appropriated versus larger and not appropriate agencies. Thank you I, I like you kind of answered a few of my questions at once without even asking them. Um, I was looking more towards policy changes just because I do focus on policy and I have a lot of research skills just because I've done a few research here and there so that's where I'm trying to like go towards I'm trying to find what you found that email of yours that magical email is what I'm looking for as well right now so it was great to hear from you yeah John where should students be watching for opportunities from the Fed are you on usajobs.gov um, or is it separate yeah, so we're actually separate and there are a few other agencies that are as well. So I think it's also another good myth busting that I like to do. I'll throw our direct careers link in the chat so that way anyone on the call has it. Um, not all federal agencies are on USA Jobs. Um, we actually will hopefully, I'm actually hoping that we start posting just so the jobs are up there. You still won't apply through USA Jobs. Mm -hmm. um, but it's funny because it's actually a no agency is actually required to use USA Jobs. Um, so, you know, publish that, tell the Wall Street Journal, whoever you want to tell. Um, so it's actually kind of a service that agencies actually opt into. So yeah, the landscape is all a little different. Um, it's funny because I think a lot of people think of federal recruiting as very uh, uniformed in ways that it actually isn't. I mean, there are things like, you know, meeting absolute minimum requirements for the GS level and you know, having a federal resume, things like that. Yes, you do, right? And veterans preferences and other preference areas and if the position is competed or not, and, you know, is it in a union? There are a lot of, I would say, traditional labor laws and constraints, but otherwise, each agency is its own independent thing. They have their own culture, they have their own HR teams or not. Um, and, and even so even for us too, like we're not on the GS scale, we don't put our jobs on USA jobs. So I actually get to function aside from just having some policy constraints in the back end, I actually get to function a lot like a private sector recruiter, which is really cool. Um, you know, I can post a job right away if I want to, I can take it down, I can hire someone without running them through 65 background investigations. Um, so yeah, so, but you can find our opportunities there um, and you'll find most agencies on USA Jobs. Um, but sometimes I think it's helpful just to search like for other agencies that are out there that you may not have heard of that may be related to your work and see if, if they do post elsewhere. Um, yeah. Any other questions?
John, just the last one, um, when you, Jennifer had asked her question in the lines of getting into recruiting, do you have any suggestions on job titles to be seeking out um, when doing the search? I know industry to industry, it's gonna look very, very different, um, but any ideas with what uh, might be a good starting point or foundation for students to be thinking about? Yeah. Um... So thankfully for like your, and this was actually something I didn't really know a whole lot about until I kind of got to see the back end of LinkedIn um, and indeed in some of the recruiter side of things and, you know, talk to those folks like our sales reps um, to understand like how the Boolean works and the uh, algorithms and all that. So for your large aggregators like LinkedIn and Indeed, they're going to be pretty, they're pretty smart. It's actually amazing how much you don't have to think about searching. So you can really try just about any job title that you think might be related or that you've seen before to what you're interested in, and you're going to find 95% of what is applicable for you, um, which is cool. I'd say the trickier part of that and the thing that you, that I always caution folks of is, um, so when those aggregators are running to, they are searching both on job title and they're also searching on keyword content in job postings, right? So my hiring managers get annoyed at me because I make a big deal about like, what are, what are our keywords? Like, do we have the right keywords in the job posting, right? Not just the title. Um, and we also have, especially, and it's also kind of a government thing, but not just, um, you know, really weird formal job titles, right? So my first job title here was a management analyst. Like, what does that mean? Do I manage analyzing? Do I analyze management? What does that mean? <laughs> Um, if I was recruiting for that, I would have called my own job a recruiting coordinator, right? And that would have pinged. Um, no one's going to find, no one would have found that job if all it said was management analyst or not the right people, right? Because um, it would have been people who maybe were already management analysts in the government and were doing totally different things that weren't recruiting, right? They could have been a budget person and then it just would have been a total mismatch. So I say that too, just don't um, be careful not to write anything off too quickly by the job title that you see. Um, take a few extra seconds to review the posting always, because um, you never know how you might be surprised. Um, I didn't have that problem with it when I applied because I got directed by a Penn State contact to the opening at the Fed. But then looking at the posting, I'm like, I don't know if this would have caught my attention mm -hmm. if I wouldn't have been directed to it and then wouldn't have been able to kind of inquire a little further. Um, so yeah, and I think also too, like talk to folks who are, um, you know, in uh, in the areas that you're interested in or find out and see, you know, what their job titles are or just, um, you know, and, and they'll be able to know. Like I can tell you too, even, you know, there are a lot of roles that we have that I could tell you the four private sector titles I typically see, some of the government ones, um, and they're all kind of the same job. So, yeah. So I think um, that's probably my my main shtick on the on the searching piece. Um, but yeah, just don't discount anything too quickly by what the what the title is. Um, because yeah, it, it, you'll run away from it. And then also, if you end up getting that job, then you're going to have to actually adjust it yourself, right? So I never told anyone I was a management analyst when I had that job. If I interviewed for anything else, I was a recruiting coordinator. Um, and that's an okay lie to do because <laughs> it works. It just made more sense. <laughs> yeah, right. It's all about like, it's all about brand recognition and what makes sense to people and what translates. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. I was recently on a, a webinar with NACE, um, the National Association of Colleges and Employers, and a gentleman from Deloitte, who's head of their HR, was saying that LinkedIn um, had been the top job being sought after or posted was more of a software engineer type position and now it's a recruiter. So for those of you here that are interested, um, he was sharing that he sees a real um, advancement in that area um, for, for future positions available. Well, thank yeah. you all so much for being here. John, thank you so much for your time and great advice. It's wonderful to hear your story and um, hear how Penn State has been engaged with that. Um, just a side note, and part of the alumni career conversation is that we're inviting our alumni mentors to come and join us and share their career path. Um, so you're all welcome if you haven't already to request an alumni mentor through our program and you'll find that on our website, um, the Career Enrichment Network website, um, or you're welcome to reach out to me as well. Um, and uh, we can connect you with someone for those of you who might be more interested in the Fed or policy uh, or in the HR realm, we, we have over 800 alumni who are ready and willing to have those informational interviews and connect with you on their career. So 
Well, with that said, thank you all for being here, John. Wonderful to see you and get to meet you um, virtually. Uh, and I hope we can work again together in the future. Yeah, thank you all. Okay, bye-bye.